Hi, everyone. Um, so we've got Jacob Kramer and Stephanie Scholes here, who are the author and illustrator of their debut nonfiction book, Looking Up, which is a, whoop, a celebration of telescopes, their shapes, sizes, and the science that they enable. Whoop. Space is kind of consuming it a little bit. Um, <laughs> which just launched last week. And we've got Dr. Michelle Thaler here, who is an astrophysicist that works at NASA with over two decades of science communication experience here to talk about space as well um, as Jacob and Stephanie's lovely new book, again, consumed. Um, so Jacob graduated from Harvard with a degree in visual and environmental studies where he joined the Student Astronomers Club he lives in Providence, Rhode Island, but his passion for large telescopes has taken him as far as Mauna Kea in Hawaii. And he is the author of Noodle Finch and Okapi Tale, published by Enchanted Lion Books. And of course, Looking Up, which we're gonna be talking about today. And this is Stephanie Scholes, who illustrated Looking Up, and she studied drawing and printmaking at the University of Fine Arts in Berlin and the Academy of Fine Arts in Bologna. Um, she's created illustrations for the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, The New Yorker, and The Economist. Um, and over the last year, she's worked as an art director at the Berliner Zidane. Did I say that? Okay. Zeitung am Wochenende. Yeah, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> Week in Edition, which is a daily newspaper based in Berlin, and she will soon be based in London. And um, yeah, lastly, we've got Dr. Michelle Thaler here, who is a fellow graduate of Harvard as well, astronomer and space scientist at the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Maryland, where you are at right now, right? Okay, cool. Well, I'm at my Maryland. house near there. <laughs> in Maryland. <laughs> um, yeah, and her research involves the life cycles of stars, and she's appeared in television science programs, including How the Universe Works and Space's Deepest Secrets, and she's done two TED Talks about astronomy. Um, so yeah, I will start by um, saying that since I've read Looking Up, um, I've kind of started to look at the moon as an actual sphere with a shadow again, rather than like a flat circle, which I feel like is just kind of a habit that I've gotten into as you kind of forget that everything like above us has depth, you know, sometimes. Um, and so, yeah, that said, I'm really excited to be here with both of you guys today to talk about the book and telescopes and space. Um, and you can order looking up um, through our distributors at penguinrandomhouse.com or any of your local bookshops. Um, and yeah, so one thing that I love about looking up is that it exists at the intersection between science and creativity. Um, so before the three of you launch into your discussion, I'd like to kick things off, I guess, by asking Jacob and Stephanie um, how they bring creativity um, to the world of science and telescopes, because um, that's something I think that really jumped out at me. Um, How yeah. do we do that? Um, I, I have a really good friend from school who has become a scientist and that's how I know Jacob. And I've always found that her life and how she thinks about things, uh, even though she has a lot more knowledge than me and goes a lot deeper, but somehow the process and the, um, way of trying out things and the whole creativity of trying to find new solutions of looking at things is so similar and uh, all most of the, her people that I've met who do this completely different work I found it so fascinating the passion and the way they want to find out about the world and I think that's a really similar way doing something completely different to try to learn about the world Therefore, bringing the two together seemed really natural and nice and enriching one to the other. Um, and I also find my work becomes more valuable if I can try to turn something into a visual image, which might be very conceptual and very cerebral. You know, it's like, I, for me, it's the, the nicest way to try to combine these two worlds. And it's when it makes me the happiest. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I love that. Um, I definitely noticed like the, just like, I think the first thing that I noticed is like, when I, if I, when I was a kid, I wish I had something like this to communicate, like, you know, facts like this in the way that both of you guys did, because it was like really engaging and I'm a visual learner and also, yeah, so I thought it was great. Thank you. 
Yeah, I, I just to add on to what uh, Stephanie was saying, like this group of people who we both know who are sort of they're scientists, but there's no um, there's no distance between the science that they do and their other interests, and um, that is very inspiring to just think of uh, scientific ideas uh, and artistic practices and ways of talking, you know, between friends. That these are all kind of um, can blend together. So I think that this way of trying to like simplify um, concepts, you know, for a different audience definitely came from, from that kind of interaction with people who are actually doing that scientific work. Yeah, it's all, all a way to try to learn about the world, right? And there are many different roads, but it's a similar approach. Yeah, well, thank you. Um... Yeah, so if you guys want to take it away, um, whoever wants to kind of start off with uh, your questions, um, feel free. And I'm here to keep tabs on time and everything. So yeah, if you guys want to kind of, where, whoever wants to kind of start um, by asking Michelle anything, um, yeah, by all means. Can I, can I just say one thing though, that looks sort of to agree with the, the, the statements before. So you said, you know, the intersection of, of science and creativity. And I have to say, you know, with all due respect, I was like, ah, <laughs> it's creativity. Really? The intersection. I mean, so, so you think science is not creative? No, no. My, I was trying to say that it's the same. Well, no, but Kelsey. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that was, that was, that was your statement. That was your statement that the intersection of science and creativity. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, the whole part, the whole idea of science is we don't know the answers, right? I mean, science is not a collection of facts. It's about asking questions and it's about, you know, thinking you have to use your imagination about, you know, you know okay, I, I would like to know how long stars live. Or, you know, I would like to know how many stars there are in, in the universe. And, and how do you ask that question that's never been answered before? And, you know, the, um, I think one of the big cultural tragedies, actually, has been that people portray science as something that's very dry and very boring and dull and just, you know, facts that you memorize. When, um, in fact, to me, um, science is all about being curious and just a bit mischievous, right? I mean, you have to be able to ask these questions and be brave enough and, and have enough confidence in yourself. And that's a hard thing for a lot of children to think that I have the ability to answer this question. It, it, may, not, it may not be easy. It may not, it may not be something that I can answer right away, but, but I have in myself the power to ask a question and to answer it. And, and when you have that in yourself, all of a sudden, the world becomes this sort of precious, mysterious place, but a place that you can go into and, and actually, you know, ask questions. And I think that, totally. you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a coincidence that many scientists are musicians and artists. Uh, we write poetry, we write novels. Um, you know, it, uh, I, I paint, you know, I dance. It, um, there, there's, you know, the, the, your, your mind has to stay alive to be a scientist. And, and one of the things that I think is, is, is the most you know, precious part of the arts is that it keeps our minds and our spirits alive. And so, you know, I, one of the, the things that I really sort of tell people, you know, there's a myth that there is a left and right side brain, and one is very analytical and logical, and one is very creative and artistic. It turns out that's not true. There's actually no evidence of that at all. There are areas in our brain that we know are responsible for speech or responsible for moving our limbs or whatever, but there's no such thing as a logical brain and a creative side of our brain. It's, it's all together. Yeah, no, um, I love all of that. I think definitely as a young person, like, yeah, science and creativity were literally like just so different and in the classes that we also had as choices at you know at my middle school and high school, it was the way that things were taught was very segmented, and um, I think it's also yeah definitely the types of people that our teachers and educators are make a big difference in the way that you learn information as well. So um, I love that yeah all of you guys are bringing like kind of making that known that science and creativity are the same. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. I also, uh, I, I was beautiful um, 
what you said there before, Dr. Tala, that was really, I, I loved hearing all of that. And I think um, this tragedy of reserving science to a, a specific group or, you know, to, to sort of narrowing it off and saying, this is not for you, um, was also a big motivation for me to want to make this book. Because when I was a little girl, I found science books looked like they were for boys, all the color choices, the characters in there. And um, we both were really keen to have, you know, a really inclusive book with lots of children from all over the world and uh, colors. I mean, the book is also about light, obviously, because it's about seeing, it's about telescopes. And I just wanted it to be full of bright, beautiful colors and this stupid idea of gendering colors, you know, saying you get pink and you get blue and da 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 just everything for everyone and to have it be really, really inviting. Um, and I think if I had found books like that as a girl, I would have loved this stuff. It took me much later. I had to go into my to my 20s to all of a sudden sort of wake up and uh, realize astronomy is, is astounding and beautiful. And how can you not want to think about it all the time and read about it and so on? So to, to also try to remove these barriers in, in how we think and how we, who's allowed to do what was really a, a, a big part of wanting to make this book. Um, how would you, so when you talk to, do you talk to children, you're, you are also involved in, in communicating your, um, your knowledge, right? How do you try to um, bring this enthusiasm and this um, openness and how do you try to take away their fear if you've, you can feel that there's worry about, I don't have the right answer or uh, I'm not sure what to say. I feel you know, scared by, by the math or, or whatever pops up. Well, I, I guess one of the things I do is tell them about my own struggles with the way science was taught. And, you know, I, um, I, I completely agree with you. You know, I, um, um, even today, I have a lot of trouble with professors that I call the gatekeepers of science, you know, that teach science in a way that they kind of challenge you. It's like, okay, you know, I've, I've brought you halfway into this problem to solve. Now do the rest and figure it out yourself. And if you don't, then you shouldn't be a scientist. And, um, you know, I, uh, I have to say that going to Harvard, and I actually enjoyed Harvard quite a bit. Uh, specifically, I enjoyed the visual arts classes and the history classes and the philosophy classes. The science classes were taught, I mean, not necessarily in an unfriendly way, but they were taught as this gatekeeper way that, you know, let me challenge you to see if you are up to being a scientist. Um, I mean, you can teach a science. You can teach science any way you like. I mean, I mean, you know, th this idea that it has to be sort of this challenge and this confrontation, and um, you know, I had to to sort of stand outside the classroom sometime at Harvard, and kind of work myself into this character of this this confident person that knew what I was doing. I was totally lost. I was completely <laughs> and utterly lost and terrified the entire time. The entire time. Um, I, I really enjoyed my research. Uh, I started doing research with professors, the astronomy professors at Harvard, and that was great. They were wonderful when I got a chance to sort of do one-on-one -on -one research with them. But um, the actual formal way it was taught left me very frightened and very confused. So part of it is being an apologist for science and saying, you know, the actual, uh, the actual process of being a scientist is much, much different from the, the classwork. But, but, but then we get to, we need to get a little more activist about this because these, this, this gatekeeping is doing science a huge harm. I mean, like you said, if science is reserved only for a small part of the, of, of the population and so many people, people of different cultures, people of different ethnicities and economic standing and gender and, 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 and all of those spectrums that humans fall on. You know, if any of those people get the impression that science is not for them, then, then you know, I think our culture is basically dead. Um, you know, we, we, we need to have inclusivity, not as just something that's nice. And, oh, wouldn't it be, you know, very nice of us and moral to bring everybody into science? Uh-uh, no. This is something we absolutely need for science. We also um, miss out on all this talent, right? You, you miss out on the talent, but you also miss out from something even more important, which is input from a diverse group of people. You know, at, at NASA, one of the things we've really observed, and we've actually done like the mathematics behind this, this is a, a mathematics called game theory, where if you actually look at solving a difficult problem, 
you know, so how are we going to get these astronauts from Apollo 13 back safely? All, you know, whatever difficult problem it throws at you. Uh, actually, just last year, we went to go visit an asteroid with a robotic spacecraft, and the asteroid turned out to be entirely different from how we designed our spacecraft to sample it. So we had to redesign everything. It was already there. What do we do? And the, the, you know, the best way to solve these problems is to have many different kinds of minds input. People who are artistic, people who are creative, people who can work with data or math, people who are good at speaking and organizing people, people who are good at making people comfortable and feel you know, that they can all contribute. Um, you, you're going to actually find the best solution if, if you bring yourself, not how you think a scientist should be, you know, I, I can't take people telling me I'm stupid and I hate getting Fs and I hate the confrontation and I get overwhelmed if there's too much stimulation, but, but, but I can think in ways other people can't. And if you bring all, all of yourselves, every, every child, you know, not who you think you should be, but who you really are, that's how science will progress. To Definitely. add on to that, I think one of that's really one of the things that Steffi and I were inspired by when we started learning more about these large observatories and the science that happens with them is just how collaborative it is and how international it is. Um, because they're just these incredible projects that um, you know, occur in all these wildly different places all over the globe with people either physically there or remotely there, like using this equipment that was, you know, the, the mirrors were you know, like poured in one country, polished in another, shipped to a third country um, in a way that is, you know, very inspiring when you think about, you know, like where we need to go as, um, you know, humanity. And so that's, that's sort of like inclusion element, even though, you, you know, like sort of astronomy maybe has a reputation of being kind of austere or like, um, you know, very like, sort of distant from people. Um, what we found when we looked when we looked closer at it was that it's very human, very interactive, very warm, um, international, um, with a diverse, you know, kind of perspective. Um, so that that we tried to kind of include some of that language. Um, and also like just in the way that I use some words and labels in the books. Like I don't I don't use the word scientist. Um, even though, of course, like I respect that people are scientists who do this work, we use the word observer because we thought that that would bring it closer to the audience. Um, because anyone, you know, presumably anyone could observe this if they had the right tools, um, which is what the book is about, these tools. And the, those tools are so amazing. I mean, when you think about all of these big telescopes, so, I mean, I've worked at the VLT, I've worked at ALMA, I've worked at the Anglo-Australian Telescope, I've worked at Kitt Peak, I've worked at Keck, and, um, you know, and, and others, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, all the stuff that I've done, you know, with, with, with the space-based observatories, none of these missions are done just by one nation. You know, they are all consortiums of many, many different countries, even things like, you know, the Mars rover, you know, that's you know, amazing contributions from France, from Spain, from the Netherlands, from Canada. Um, you know, I mean, the I, I sometimes get the question, you know, are, are you is, is NASA feeling, you know, competition because other countries are, are getting into space, but they don't understand like, you know, the, the United Arab Emirates launched a mission to Mars uh, recently, but that, that, uh, that, that spacecraft and the instruments were largely built in the United States, you know, partially uh, with help from NASA and also universities that the spacecraft was built at the University of Colorado. I mean, the, 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 these things are not done in isolation. And as an astronomer and as a scientist, I'll, I'll, I'll use that word in, in the best sense. Um, if you can't collaborate and communicate and if you can't make people feel comfortable with you, um, then you are, you're at a huge disadvantage because it's all about building teams. And you have to be able to get teams of people work. And, and as we said before, you have to get diverse teams, people from different countries, people who are quiet and reserved, people who are enthusiastic and excited. And you, you need to make sure you can manage all of these people and all of these countries together. And so that's, um, that's part of being a scientist that I think they leave out in the training is, you know, we, I mean, we, we, we are trying to, to, to solve that, you know, to correct that at NASA and, you know, training our scientists and things like emotional intelligence and diversity training um, in, you know, in, in communication training. I mean, all of those things are now part of our training for our scientists. Amazing. I also wanted to ask you, because we've, 
Um, I mean, a part of the idea of the, the book was to really look one by one at these huge observatories, these huge telescopes and, and see how they look different. I um, wanted to make this book first before even thinking about the science because I think they're so beautiful. I said so we came like from the completely wrong direction. Observatories look incredible. And then by chance, they're in the most beautiful places on the planet as well, because they have to be remote, they have to be somewhere in the desert on top of a hill. You know, what wonderful combination, yet no one had has built it in a decorative way or something. It's just all chance somehow, no? It has to build, be built in a certain way. What is it like to be there? Um, Jacob has, has gone to, he went to Hawaii. I haven't actually set foot in one, but I've seen uh, everything that I could find, uh, all the, you know, films and the photo footage. You, you're very remote, right? And um, yeah, I, I would love to know to, to, if you could tell me a little bit what it's like to be in these wonderful places. Oh, wow. I mean, you see me smiling. I'm getting, you know, goosebumps as I, I sit here. They, they, are, they are so wonderful and so beautiful. And I'm, I, I don't think it's approaching it from the wrong way to say that. So when you talk about them being decorative, you know, I, I grew up um, in, near Chicago, and there was a, an observatory called the Yerkes Observatory, which was built in the late 1800s. And it had one of those old refractor telescopes, the long ones with a big lens at the end. And um, the, the whole observatory had been carved and it was crusted with signs of the zodiac and, and you know, faces coming out of columns, moon faces. And, and, you know, and I think that you know, Mount, Mount Palomar, which I've worked at, which is an old telescope built you know, in the 1930s, um, I think that's the most elegant and beautiful telescope I've seen. I've worked on the modern ones, but those old ones really have this, this incredible elegance. Um, I guess I, I always have sort of two different feelings when I'm at an observatory. Um, it's, it's a cross between being in this, I have to say, the sacred space in a temple. You're in this, this, this vast dome, unbelievably huge machines around you, but they're all precision balanced. They can turn so quietly and so smoothly, well, in some cases, quietly, if they're working right. Um, but then the other, the other impression I get is, um, how come all the adults left and left me alone with this amazing <laughs> treasure, this candy shop? And I, I still look around. I'm, I'm 51 years old, and I'm like, where'd all the grown-ups go? And you know, th there's sort of this childlike enthusiasm. I mean, I mean, sometimes you're tired. You've, you've been working all night. Uh, you have you know wonderful challenges. Like in Australia, they had giant harmless spiders in the dome, but they were like bigger than tarantulas. Huntsman. And uh, yeah, they're called huntsman spiders. And and they they were. I had to get I had to befriend them because at first I was. I mean, I, I mean, I'm okay with spiders, but these things were huge, like the size of a dinner plate. And so I, I named them and, oh, I, that's just Fred. Don't worry about Fred. Um, but, uh, you know, but then I would walk home at night after observing through the eucalyptus forests, you know, and the moon would be rising and I'd be all by myself. And the kangaroos would be, you know, hopping out in the dawn. You know, the, the sacredness of, you know, of walking home on top of Kit Peak at night, you know, going past um, ancient petroglyphs from, you know, the, the, the native peoples that live there and feeling this chill, you know, um, being up, being up, you know, on the mountain on a bad night in a thunderstorm, but being all by yourself in the middle of a thunderstorm. Um, these observatories are a combination of, of sacredness and I can't believe somebody let me in here. Yeah, I had, I had a similar feeling. I just visited as like a, you know, Basically, like a glorified tourist, I guess. I was given a tour of the Keck Observatory in Mauna Kea. And like, I just couldn't believe how, you, you mentioned like the balance of these mechanisms and they're just like, the whole thing can be moved with one hand. Like they're just so, they're built so beautifully um, that it's quite moving just to like be next to them. Um, and then also you mentioned like the sort of natural landscape that they're in and I, what, I love about Steffi's illustrations is that these installations are integrated into the landscape and we see like animals um, sometimes quite playfully like there on the page alongside these, um, you know, these highly engineered and, and strange human shapes, you know, we see like llamas and lizards and snakes and um, we tried to make an effort to, to make these two worlds kind of commensurate in the way that you might experience them if you were to visit them, that they're not fully separate. Um, and that like the, the eyes, like if that basically like, 
you know, if you were to grow your eye really big, like some animals, like the, the eye eye, mm -hmm. you know, that this is a vast magnification of that impulse to be able to see in the dark, like, um, and that this is sort of this um, human drive and curiosity for more information has manifested these huge extensions of our sensory universe um, in a way that's not so different from other animals on our planet. I, I love eye eyes. They're, they're the coolest looking things. I mean, I've always been a sort of a fan of like Halloween like things. They, they're just so incredible. Oh, oh, there's an eye eye in the book. Yeah. Oh, well done. <laughs> oh, oh, I love this book already. I, 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 <laughs> it's, even, it's even got the great little finger. Oh, that's yeah, wonderful. Really, um... I, I love eye eyes. These, these places really absorb our souls. I mean, I'm, I'm tearing up a little bit about you know, Keck because my, my husband built some of the precision instruments there and um, he, he died last year. And, you know, it, uh, it's, 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 you know, I, I go there and it's his soul, right? I mean, it's his questions that he, he wanted to answer. It's, it, he's still there. So, you know, I see the things that he built, you know, the things that his hands touched. I mean, these are places where we put our spirits and we put our hearts and we put our creativity. You know, I, I think that, you know, I was a lucky uh, generation of astronomers because nowadays, like you said, they, they mainly do what's called queue observing, which is the queue is the word for line, especially in, in Europe, you know, waiting in line, waiting in a queue where you, 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 you know, the, the way you get time on a telescope as an astronomer is usually about once a year, they have a big review committee of scientists come together and you write to them and say, I would like to use the telescope for so many nights. I want to look at this object. And you, and you give them, uh, you, have to, you have to give them, you know, you have to convince them that, that, that you know, this is a big investment of, of time and money and people will be working the telescope. You know, why should they have, have you? Why should they do your project? And so you need to tell a story. You need to tell them why it's important that, that you get a chance to use this telescope. And then, you know, the review committee looks at all of this and decides and prioritizes, you know, who, who gets the, uh, the time. And it used to be that, that if they gave you time, they just said, okay, you can have the dates of July 12th through 18th. Those are yours. And then you would go there and it was luck of the draw as to whether you had good weather or whether something was broken at the time, you know, or I mean, all of those things. And so sometimes you, you got your, your data that you wanted and sometimes you didn't. And now to make things easier, they basically just prioritize everything and then have the professional people that run the telescope just do one after another. And then they just send you, they email you <laughs> your data. And, um, you know, I was kind of right at the cross of that happening. So I, I had plenty of times where I got rained out and didn't get my data, but I was also physically there, physically adjusting the instruments and, and, and doing that. And that, that was wonderful. But I have to say that the new observing does actually make more sense, you know, just to prioritize everything and then just, you know, go up, well, one after another, what they think is the most important. So uh, that's a, and, and that, that's a big part of being an astronomer is writing, but being able to write and tell a good story. Um, as to why, you know, okay, the Hubble Space Telescope, you know, there, there are 10 times as many astronomers at least, you know, who would like to use every little hour as they, if they only give it to one, 10 other people would love to use that. Um, you know, how come it should be your project? So you need to make sure you can tell a good story and, and, and write that as well. How, Jacob, I do have a question for you branching off of what um, Dr. Thaler was just kind of saying with the writing, like, how, what was your process like with writing, like for the book? Like how, I mean, I know that you could go to start from many places, but how did the, yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about your writing process? Sure. Well, uh, yeah, the initial sort of like idea for this came from Steffi's like interest in the, the physical structure of these, these um, instruments and stuff. So then like, cause we are talking about different possible projects and um, I was like, okay, I can learn about telescopes and observatories. So I did some initial research. Um, I found a very good book um, that I read it's called A Spectrum of Telescopes, I think. Um, that, that was sort of the foundation of my understanding. I'd done some astronomy in high school and I'd been a member of like a club and stuff. So I had some basic understanding of like lenses, mirrors, light, um, those concepts, so I had to revisit those. And then as I was revisiting them, I tried to understand, you know, like what would you need to understand in order to understand a telescope? And I decided you're gonna need, you're gonna need to know like what 
basically what sight is, what light is, what uh, images and reflection are, what focusing is, and with those, and, and maybe wavelength, and, and like the, with those constant wavelength color, kind of just using color as shorthand for wavelength. And with those concepts, you could get pretty far with understanding these different installations, why they are in the places they are, and a little bit about why they are the shape that they are. Um, so then using that like basis of, of like scientific introduction, um, went through the spectrum in the manner of that book that I mentioned, sort of saying like, there, there are redder colors and there are more purple colors. So we're gonna start with the redder ones, go all the way to the longest wavelengths, and then we'll go to the purple ones, go all the way to the shortest wavelengths. Um, and yeah, just sort of using a bit of, like I made some vocabulary choices, like I mentioned using like observer instead of scientist, like I use color of light instead of like wavelength of electromagnetic radiation, because I just felt like if we talk about colors of light, that's, that's pretty familiar to the audience. Accessible. And then later, of course, they'll learn the specific vocabulary um, and trying to come up with metaphorical languages, language that might stick with them that was still kind of like scientifically accurate. So to say like, you know, like there are different places on earth where you could go to gather different colors of light the way you would go to a different place to gather a different kind of fruit set. Um, and like that kind of metaphor being familiar to a kid. Um, and it's not, you know, in, entirely false. <laughs> Uh, or maybe Dr. Thaler can comment on that. But um, I like so that. I, tried yeah. to, I try to use that that kind of metaphorical language that um, would kind of be a hook to say to signal, you know, this is this is within your grasp to the audience, like we were saying before, to kind of like bring people into it. Yeah, all of us at Flying Eye really like the long dog thing, <laughs> like using the long dog as like a metaphor for pattern and how you can. Yeah, I think that's what I remember. But um, and yeah. one of the important things, of course, is that there are all these wonderful things in the universe you can only see in one of those colors, right? So you know, if you if you want to see if you want to see planets around other stars, right? I mean, all pretty much all the stars we see in the sky have their own solar system of planets around them, but you're not going to be able to see them in the type of light that our eye sees. You have to go to things that are a little bit too red for us to see. You know, I mean, some people use the analogy of music that if you had a, uh, a whole keyboard of a piano, right? I mean, our eyes only see like, like the three notes around middle C for light. And there's so much more sound to play with, um, you know, or, or if, you, if you go to the most purple light, you see, you see the, I mean, I mean there, are, there are giant explosions in space and you only see those with the purple light, right? You can't see them anywhere else. So, I mean, the whole thing is, you know, the reason we need these different kinds of fruit or different kinds of colors of light is there are things you can't see any other way. And I mean, and, and to me, it all gets down to the question of, you know, okay, why? You know, I mean, I mean you know, you know, why do we want to see all these? Because you're not going to be able to understand the universe by looking at just one thing. You know, you have to be able to, to ask the questions in all the type of light. Yeah, that brings me to one of the questions we had for you, which is if you could personally extend your own physical senses to receive another wavelength or kind of light, what would you choose and why? Oh, wow. <laughs> Let's see. Well, so, you know, of course, you know, my science mind is thinking, well, you know, which ones are absorbed by the atmosphere? I'd have to be in space to see, and that would not be very good. <laughs> but, uh, um, you know, it's funny because I think I think one of the things that people don't realize is just how much how much space you know above us is not actually dark at all. It's just it's just only dark in the colors that our eyes happen to be sensitive to. I think that uh, I'm sure I'm sure you, Jacob, and I'm not I'm not sure if the other people you've seen pictures of what the sky would look like if you could see in say you know the mid infrared you know which is you know, a little a little bit more red than we can see. Um, you know, the, the constellation Orion, which is my favorite constellation. I always you know, see it up in the sky and kind of feel like I'm looking at a friend. If you could see in this slightly redder light, uh, that whole area is a, a nursery for new stars. You know, there are thousands and thousands of new baby stars being born, but they're being basically born inside, inside blankets. They're being born inside these wonderful warm clouds of, of dust. 
And, and so because of that, it looks dark to our eyes. But if you could see in this, in this light, that whole area of the sky would be rings and loops and beautiful glowing areas, the whole sky. I mean, not just little bits of it. You'd see you know, all of the sky around Orion as this bright glowing nursery with the, the stars and little cocoons. And um, you know, just, just think about how beautiful that would be. So you know, I, I guess you know, as far as me, you know, going to the slightly redder parts of light, you would see so much more in the sky, and uh, that would be uh, that would be wonderful. The um, you know the, the 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 more purple lights, the stuff that gets hot and very violent, exploding stars. You know, that that all sounds very violent and very you know scary. But you know, I, I think that the one thing I, I wish. You know, I know there are some children's books on this, but but one that I, I've never seen one that I, I thought was, was really did it quite right, is that um, you know teaching t- teaching children that we know that you know that 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 you know their bodies come from the stars, you know that uh, you know the the only way the universe makes you know oxygen to breathe. And I wouldn't say oxygen to a child, but you know with the things the calcium in their bones, you know the the iron that makes their blood red. You know, the, you know, you, you, you really did come from those stars up there, or at least ones that used to be and then died, uh, you know, a long time ago. I mean, that's a beautiful thing. And, and I, I really do wish every person in the world knew that. And I, I'm surprised that that's not something that's covered in, in elementary school, at least in middle school. But, you know, it, it amazes me that every person who goes to school is not taught that we know where all of your body came from. And it was from the stars. Should we do that next? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I would like yeah, to well, do a, a children's book. Yeah. If, 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 if you guys would like to collaborate on a children's book, especially if there's an <laughs> I.I. involved, you know, I'm totally there. We do say that. We talk we about, we talk about like, supernova. Yeah, stuff. yeah. And at the end, we talk about it. And I, but it's not, yeah, it's not so specific. We don't drive it home that much, though, no? Yeah. We could. We could focus on it. Yeah, I, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard to teach kids when you can't. I mean, I, you know, what is an atom? You know, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I mean, so I mean, pitching it just right. So a child has a chance to absorb it. And sometimes I think, you know, getting it a little bit above isn't so bad as long as you're very friendly about it. You know, they'll maybe they don't understand everything at first, but then they, that, that makes them curious. You know, I would like to understand what an atom is. And it, it, you know, we're made of these tiny little things. And we know that each different one comes from stars. And, you know, I mean, it's um. You know, it, it, it's something that we'd have to, you know, do some research to figure out, you know, at what age can you really, can kids start to absorb that? But, but, but even before they do, just the idea that, you know, we know you're from there. I mean, I, um, my mom, uh, my, my parents are not scientists and they're, they're very uh, human oriented, human rights. They were involved in, you know, the civil rights movement in the 60s and all of that. And, you know, when they, when they gave birth to a child that, you know, as soon as I could walk, I wanted to go out and look at these little lights in the sky. They're just like, you know, Hey kid, why you know why would you be interested in little lights in the sky? But um, I, I'm I'm amazed that uh, the story of those little lights in the sky is incredibly deep and incredibly intimate to us as humans, and it connects every single person on the planet, right? I mean, the one thing we all have in common is our origin in the stars. That's a beautiful thing. My mother said to me, she doesn't like looking up; it scares her. I'm sure you've you've oh. come across this before too, and I think it's an incredible way to think about this, you know, beautiful vastness above you that it's terrifying. And she said she had to now, she had to read my book. It got a little bit better, <laughs> it helped a little bit. But um, how would you respond to that? That some people also just, it's, it's you know, if, if my mom was sitting across from you, how do you take the fear of the, the vastness also and the terrifying stuff that happens up there sometimes? You know, I think a, a corollary question is how do you talk to children about things that are honestly scary? You know, yeah. I mean, I mean, how do you talk to them about the fact that, you know, you know, we, we are only alive for a certain period of time. We don't live forever. You know, children will lose their grandparents. You know, I mean, you know, sometimes even worse things happen in the world. And, you know, when you, when you look up into the sky, you do see a much larger reality a lot bigger than yourself. And you are only going to be a little small part of that. That's all you can do. There's nothing, we, we, we can't change the condition we find ourselves in. We are small, limited, mortal things. However, you know, I, I, I think that instead of um, pushing the fear away and saying, you know, you shouldn't be afraid, you know, what, what you have to do 
in life is learn to hold it. You know, you have to learn to hold that fear in you and realize it's part of you and not fight it. And sometimes you're just going to feel afraid. And other times you can, you can kind of walk with that fear and invite it in for a cup of hot chocolate, you know, you can form a relationship with that fear and, and, you know, and realize you're part of a beautiful thing. I mean, you know, I, I am scared. I'm scared of the dark. I can be scared of spiders. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm scared of, you know, my mortality, all of these things that is part of being a real human. Mm. You know, you can live in denial. You can hide from the stars or you can learn to, to, to walk with your fear. And, you know, I, um, I've done so many things. I'm afraid of flying. And, you know, and yet I've been to the Himalayas, you know, I've been to Death Valley, I've been to all of these observatories. And I, I keep telling myself, you know, if you want to do something, sometimes the fear doesn't go away. So you have to do it afraid. And, and, and you'll be glad that you did it because, you know, the world is so beautiful. And I didn't just want to hide under my bed for the one little time that I'm alive. And so if you can talk to your mother about the fact that this is a big universe and it's amazing how close it is. So, you know, the, the, the earth goes around the galaxy at a, you know, we're, we're traveling at half a million miles an hour, apologies for the miles for, for Europeans. And um, we've, you know, we've, we've been around and around since the earth has formed about like 20 times. We pick up about a hundred tons a day of all of this wonderful dust and debris from space. And, you know, every star in the sky you see, we've mixed our atoms with, every single one. There, there's no separation. You know, if, if you point at a star in the sky, you know, and point to your heart, there's an atom of iron in your heart and an atom of iron in that star, light years away, that were both formed in the same explosion, the same star that exploded. You know, we have mixed, the whole galaxy is mixed together. So, you know, literally there are stars on the other side of the galaxy, a hundred thousand light years away from us, unbelievable vast distances, but they share atoms with us from the same star that blew up. You know, inside us is not just one star that died, but billions. And, you know, you know, we are vast too. We are children of, we are children of this vastness. And sometimes that's scary. And it's like saying we're children of life. You know, right now you and I are carrying the embers of what is you know, this, this ancient flame of life. We don't get to do that forever. You know, there are things in life that are truly frightening. And if you can smile at them and welcome them in, I think you'll have a better life. And also you can take yourself a little less seriously which is really helpful. No, I find I yeah. look at this guy and it does that. No room for ego up there. Yes, and all your problems just shrink. We're almost what at is it? time. Oh God. So, but I would really like so to, fast. I know, but I would really like to see some of uh, your, excuse me, your illustrations and stuff. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for that, Dr. Thaler. That was an extremely beautiful um, thing that you said. And also I just wanted to say that some of the concepts in this book are directly inspired by a video that you made um, that I watched maybe five or six years ago um, <laughs> with The Atlantic. So when uh, Kelsey reached out to say, is there anyone you want to talk to? I was like, Dr. Thaler. And you, you and I were in the same observatory, right? I mean, that student observatory with that Alvin Clark on top of the Science Center. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, I used to run open houses there. I was class of 92. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm so glad when you said student observatory at Harvard, I was like, I'm in the log books there, you know? Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah, I, I would also like to talk to you endlessly about these things. It's beautiful. Look, let's keep in touch. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm serious. I mean, if, if I would love to collaborate on a children's oh, book. Oh, that would be a heaven. And really. I, I, I've, I've always, I, I collect children's books. I, I just ordered the Underwear Dragon from Amazon. So I, I collect illustrated children's books. Um, And, and I, I, I mean, so I, I would, I would love that. That would be a dream come true. But anyway, let's get, let's get to what, what okay, Kelsey needs. Let's so. get to work. Uh, so I will, I will share my screen now, or you, we can start here too. So actually what I was doing just before I found the observatories is I was trying to find these other structures and I love these diving towers that I started drawing. And if you go to the next slide, tennis courts. So it's a bit like, off maybe to make these connections. But for me, they were somehow similar, these beautiful geometric shapes I could play with and discover that had a function and were gorgeous at the same time. And 
there's all this human activity behind it. You know, here it's the sports rules someone has figured out and the kind of same thing for the diving towers. But then if you go to the next slide, when I watched um, this documentary about the Atacama Desert, um, Nostalgia for the Light, do you know it? Beautiful documentary. I saw the, the observatories there and I found them just breathtakingly beautiful. And I thought this is such a, so much more. It's like an extension of this little idea of building something for a purpose. And then it has all these other things attached to it, you know, building something for a practical purpose, but it's actually also really interesting to look at. But this is that on steroids, because you have these beautiful structures, then a beautiful environment. They've taught us some of the most amazing things we could possibly know about the universe. So, you know, I don't know. Uh, it's this enormous uh, revelation for me to, to really think about these structures and try to understand. Um, and I also didn't know why they look so different, you know, that I had to understand what a radio telescope is and, and that there are all these other um, forms of light that different telescopes are built for in all different sizes that they float around the planet. Um, it was like a, a little door open to this huge mountain of information. So I started just drawing them and then talking to Jacob about it, who was immediately on board and really keen to, to, to dive deeper into this. And we also thought the idea is interesting because usually you have kids books about the universe and they start with this, you know, this is our solar system and here's the sun and, da, da. and we wanted to go away from that and really look at our eyes then at these huge eyes we've built and then step by step what have we learned from the huge eyes so just take a little like a slightly different angle um and um if you go to the next slide i can oh well and then also this i was going to say here that it's amazing where they are that they're all over the world that they you know i also love that uh the the crazy parts of the planet you get to know that you would never i mean i haven't been but that i got to look at um that i otherwise maybe wouldn't have considered and then what I can also show you a little bit, the process is how I then would, after Jacob had written his beautiful text, write the little, um, um, sorry, draw little sketches to try to figure out the pages to, for example, make sure that there are all sorts of um, ethnicities and uh, cultures and uh, age groups and so on although i think if you go to the final i always did a sketch and then the illustration we went for a lot of kids here um but here you can also see quite clearly how i was really keen or we were both really keen to have this female softness in there as well to just mix it all together and not you know the inclusive part um and then we can just run through the next slides uh, where I have a few more of the pages, always the sketches I do. I always try to figure out the colors a lot. Here, I probably needed to figure out how you actually hold a telescope because I thought Galileo was doing it like this. And I realized it's actually very long and it would have been impossible. Um, this is a, a, was a spread about when we tried to figure out how to show colors and to to describe, you know, that there are snakes see different colors and um, bees can see different colors and to really bring this concept home to to children that there's not just what we see, but there's, you know, vastly more. Um, I, I don't have the long dog in here, but if you continue, <laughs> then this is also a vista I find very, very beautiful too. I think the shape is so gorgeous. And then while working on this, uh, we we suddenly sort of realized that we need these cutaways because you have to be able to see the, the the telescopes as well and try to figure out the mirrors a little bit and always add a little animal. So there's a little fox there. Oh, I, I thought see. something, <laughs> something cute has to be around too. Yeah, tiny little fox. Um, and then I just uh, found a few different uh, sketches and spreads. Oh, and then we can end on this one, uh, which was just destroyed after the book was published. So I, I drew this and then like a few months later, sadly, the, the whole thing came falling down. But this was another um, combination of trying to also learn about the plants around these uh, observatories, the kind of animals that live there. And then I always 
also really love the aesthetic of, for example, the this the Arecibo uh, message. You know, the, when when something is broken down so much, but you can still see the little oops, I think the last one, the little man in the middle, and try to figure out what they were trying to say by sending this into space. Um, yeah. Something happened to the font up there, I just noticed. I don't know what the oh, deal is. There. I see, that's very strange. Anyway, um, yeah, just to, to, to take you a little bit through the process. And we did that with all the spreads and, and slowly figured out how to like bring a narrative into there and how to um, also show all these beautiful places in a, in a nice rhythm and with different bits of information in between and to, to make sure that it's digestible and hopefully throughout uh, continuously interesting because I you know never wanted people to think like oh this is I don't know you can think all sorts of things but to make sure it doesn't feel like um, a, a book about technology only for you know well all the things we were saying before to try to bring this enthusiasm and, and this beauty into it that you have spoken about so much I don't know how much we managed but we did uh, really want that in there Oh, the beautiful. I mean, I, I love the illustrations. I, I absolutely do. And I, it's funny because as an astronomer, I immediately know. I mean, as soon as you put the first one up, I was like, oh, that's Alma and the VLTI outriggers. And, you know, I mean, and, and, I, and, and, and you're, you're triggering all sorts of things because I remembered, you know, different observing runs and different nights. And I remember standing out by those VLTI outrigger telescopes one night and I realized I was casting a shadow on the ground. And it was, it was very dark. There was no moon, even Jupiter was not up in the sky. And I realized it was the Milky Way casting a shadow. It was that that's how bright the Milky Way was when you're up in the Atacama desert. Wow. And uh, at the Alma telescopes, which I actually had pictures of me being very happy on those dishes because it's, a, it's nearly at 17,000 feet. And I get, I get very happy mainly because I'm oxygen deprived, but <laughs> I mean, every, everything, every illustration, I was like, Arecibo, I, I've been up on the catwalk you know, that, that, you know, and all that. And so, you know, every, every everything you're showing me, it, you're immediately triggering all these wonderful memories. Oh, well, that's great. I'm very pleased. Uh, well, I just wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of you for being here and participating. So I think this was a really lovely discussion. Um, and just wanted to remind all of our viewers that you can purchase Looking Up um, through our distributors at Penguin Random House and your local bookshops. And um, you can mark your calendars for our next discussion on July 27th, um, where we will actually be speaking with someone from the Alma Observatory in Chile. So get your questions ready. And thank you, everyone, for your time. And thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Welcome. you, everyone. It was bye -bye. wonderful meeting everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.